The last time that Shalbina and Honeywell gathered together for worship, each of them gathering on a Sunday, was on March 15th. It's been over two months now, 70 days. And we didn't really have a sense of what we were getting into at that point. We knew that something was happening, but it, uh, we didn't know exactly what. It strikes me that on this weekend, when we are gathering for worship again, that I should take a moment and just uh, mark this, this moment. Mark this moment at, at, during which... Um, there's been a lot of things that have, we have missed in these days. And over these last 70 days, there have been birthdays uh, that weren't celebrated, uh, vacations that didn't happen, uh, people have died that we weren't able to gather and celebrate their life. Uh, graduations have all been turned upside down. People have ended the school year, both students and teachers, and that has impacted all of us in some way. As I look forward and I look towards where we're headed, uh, we could be in this for a while. I took a look at the length of pandemics over the centuries, and it struck me that there are many of them, not all, but there are many pandemics that do last multiple years. Looking back across the centuries, I can look at things like uh, the Black Death lasted from 1346 to 1353. The cholera pandemic uh, lasted from 1852 to 1860. The, uh, there was another cholera pandemic in 1910 to 1911. The, the thing we hear about most, the comparison we hear most is the 1918 Spanish flu. That lasted until 1920. There have been multiple pandemics over the centuries. And while this is not a, like a plague-based pandemic, with a very high death rate, it is a flu-based pandemic, and those can last a while. And so we could be settling in for something that we're going to be in, in, in this thing for a while. As I was talking to another, uh, to a group of pastors about how do we think through this, how do we understand what's happening here, uh, someone made the observation that there's a difference between the first storm and then the changing of the season. When we hit the first winter storm, we, we all have a similar response, or at least it seems to be that everyone just kind of goes home and, and you just stay home and you make some hearty stew and you cancel some things and, and you just hunker down for a few days. And, and that's what we've done thus far. We've hunkered down in the initial moment. And then after the storm passes, then it's winter, and then the cold has settled in, and you can't stay hunkered down because things still have to get done. And so what you start doing is, is you start doing what needs to be done, taking precautions that make sense for that season. During the winter, I, I go and I do what I need to do, and in the back of my car is a complete set of outer gear and, and uh, the tracks I can put on my shoes so I can walk on ice if I need to, and a thick blanket, and all the gear I would need if I get stuck because of, of the snow. And uh, that type of precaution would make no sense during June, but during the winter season, that's, that's what's necessary. Necessary. And I think that's where we're at. We have gone through the first storm of this, and now we're looking at living in the season. This season that's not the season of winter, it's the season of pandemic. It's the season in which we need to mod modify our behavior in ways that make sense for this season that would not make sense in any other season. And so we're going to do that. We're, we're, gonna, we're worshiping outside, and uh, some of us are going to, that will be the extent of how it impacts us, that we'll, do, worship, we'll worship outside, and for the most of the rest of our lives, we'll look pretty normal. Some of us will be highly impacted by this because we're in a higher vulnerability group. And so I ask that we have some patience and grace with each other because we're all gonna have to handle this in the way that makes sense to our situation. The thing that I'm holding on to in the end that helps me uh, grapple with this then is uh, the words that Paul writes the church at Rome. The church at Rome does know what it means to go through a season of persecution, a season of hardship. Uh, it's a different hardship than a pandemic, but they understood what it meant to have a hard time. And what Paul writes to that church is that... Uh, 
Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Is a hardship or distress or persecution or famine? No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I believe that to be true. We'll get through this season together safely, doing the things that we need to do because of this particular very weird and hopefully uh, never again to be experienced season when we'll do it together. The reading for this day comes from the book of Acts, the first chapter. This is the account of what's called the Ascension. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After Jesus' suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood before them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up to heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. After Jesus uh, was resurrected, he gathered and taught his disciples for 40 days. He tells us that he taught them about the kingdom. This is something that Jesus had preached and proclaimed in his parables. Let me tell you, the kingdom of God is like. And so this is probably a refresher course, so to speak, going over everything that Jesus had taught them already, making sure they, they understand. We don't know exactly, but that is what my guess would be. And then after 40 days, the disciples, well... The disciples would expect something. Forty days, as we see in Scripture often, forty of anything is the length of time it takes to take this journey, to learn. Right? Forty days is how many days of rain Noah endured on the ark. Forty years is how many years it took for the people of God to be prepared to enter the promised land. Forty days is how long it took before, after Jesus was baptized before he began his ministry. And so after 40 days, uh, it is the natural sort of break point for the disciples to say, okay, Jesus, what's next? Right? And here's how they put it. They, go to, they look at Jesus and say, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Notice the pronoun there. Jesus, is this the moment when you're going to do your thing? Is this the moment when you're going to restore the Davidic kingdom and the 12 tribes of Israel will take control of the promised land once more and this is going to become the home base for all that we're going to do across the world? You got to sort of appreciate where the disciples are coming from now, right? From their point of view, they've been with Jesus for the long haul now. They've seen that Jesus has been crucified and resurrection resurrected and if that can't if death can't keep jesus down like i'm sure they're expecting that they're going to have a nice long run with jesus because well she, death can't conquer right so now they jesus is here he seems to be healthy they've been he's been sort of teaching them and getting them back up to speed and they're they're ready to go so it makes perfect sense jesus what you up to next 
And Jesus dodges the question. Right? He dodges the question. Actually, he kind of flips it back onto them. And he says, it is not for you to know the time or the period that the Father has set by his own authority. Right? I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you when the kingdom will come. That's not for you to know. And then Jesus flips it back on them a little bit more. All right? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. All right? Jesus is making it clear. I, Jesus, I'm not the one who's going to do this now. You are. You are going to receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and you are going to go across all of the known world, and you are about to do this. And this is the moment, right, when the, the disciples have been told it's not about what Jesus is about to do, it's about what they're about to do. That's when Jesus uh, ascends, right? We read, when Jesus had said this as they were watching, Jesus was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now, I don't know exactly what this would have looked like. It would have been interesting to see, right? But the message is crystal clear. Jesus, what are you going to do? Jesus looks back at them and says, no, it's about what you're about to do. And, and in fact, you're about to do it, so I, I'm out of here. And, he, and Jesus takes off. And just to drive the point home... There are two men in white appear before the disciples and say, Men of Galilee, what y'all looking up for? You got things to do. Get to them. He'll come back the way he left, but you have some stuff to, to, to do now, right? And so the disciples, they go as they were directed, and they wait for the Spirit to empower them, and then they're off, and the, the church begins. And they do as Jesus has, has directed them. And what Jesus has directed them to do, to go forth to all the people across the world, this has happened generation after generation, saint after saint. The church has, been, well, the church has been handed down to us today. They were entrusted to build this church, and that is exactly what they have have done. They've been entrusted with the good news of Jesus Christ, and then to go into the world and to enact, to embody, to become that good news for others, and that's what they did. Now, thinking about this moment, it has this sense, like, when it feels like this, this, the moment when a teenager goes to his or her parents and says, it's time for me to go to practice, and the parent tosses them the keys and says, you do it. I'm not going to drive you. You drive yourself. I'll see you in an hour, right? And uh, it's that same sense of when the disciples look at Jesus and say, well, what are you going to do next? And Jesus tosses them the keys and says, you do it. You're up. You're next. Like, if you can imagine that, that surprise, that sense of, am I sure? Are you sure? I'm not sure. I'm not ready for this. And the parent saying, yeah, you are. Go. See you in an hour. Right? That makes, that does to me make sense in light of how Jesus has worked with the disciples up to this point. Right? Jesus has said to his disciples, follow me. Right? Follow me as we travel all over, going to wherever the people are. Follow me as we listen to anyone who needs to be heard. Follow me as we serve the people who are broken. Follow me as we share the good news of the kingdom. Jesus has said to his disciples, follow me. And now, having done that for multiple years now, it is now for them to go forth and do it, right? And this is what Jesus is telling them. I'm sending you out to do what you have been doing with me. Do all the things that we did together. You go out and now you do it, right? Follow me and, and go forth and translate this good news into whatever language it is that people speak. Follow me and go out and tend to the broken, the hurt, and the lost. Follow me as you slow down and notice the wind widows who are going hungry even after they get to the church. Follow me as you stand up to challenge people that, that proclaim that something else is the good news and say, no, this, this, the news of Jesus Christ, this is what is truly good. And in following, 
What's fascinating to me is that it is in the following that the disciples find that they are becoming ever more like Christ. That one step at a time, as they are empowered by the Holy Spirit, reaping the fruit of the Holy Spirit, like the love and the joy, the peace and the patience and the goodness and the faith, faithfulness and the self-control, like as Paul, Paul lays that all out in Galatians 5. But as they, they do this one step at a time, they become more and more the people who can do this, right? Jesus doesn't look at them and say, let me fix you, and then you go do this. No, Jesus says, you go do this. And along the way, things will get worked out. Things will get fixed. Things will be healed and made whole. You will become healed and whole. Right? And so these disciples that had struggled to be peaceable, like one of the disciples has pull, had pulled a sword to strike off the ear of someone who was trying to arrest Jesus. Right? There, uh, the disciples who had, try, who had struggled to be peaceable turn into the Christ-like people who are not going to engage in violence, but will instead serve. Right? These are the people who had run at the fear of Roman persecution. And now, in the, in the days after this moment, they're the ones who will stand up to governors and to anyone to be able to say, I follow Jesus. And that's that, right? They're not going to run in fear again. Right? Jesus doesn't fix them. Jesus sends them on the journey where they grow and they strengthen themselves, by, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and in following him. They become these bold, confident, and committed disciples disciples of Jesus. What we see in the disciples inspired what they saw in Jesus is, they, is that they are at this their entire lives. Right? That's the final piece of this. That not First, it's they turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, what are you going to do? And Jesus turns it back on them and says, no, it's what you're going to do. And I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit so that you can do it. Right? So I will, I will be with you. And it's not just that Jesus sends them out. It's that Jesus sends them out to do it the way that Jesus did it. And the way that Jesus did this was he did it his entire life. Jesus served and taught and led until the very end, until he ascended. And the disciples, they do the same. We see that uh, they teach and they serve and they lead until they go to join Jesus. And, and I think that it, it shapes how we understand following Jesus as well. We're never done. Right? We are never done following Jesus. It is either a continual seeking out to be more Christ-like in what we're doing right now, or changing years to find the next, next thing that is to do. All of us can always be uh, either refining, becoming more Christ-like in, in what we're already doing, or in changing gears to find the next thing so that we find, become more Christ-like in, in a different way. It becomes clear in looking at the ascension that it is both uh, this moment in which Jesus turns to us and says, now uh, you are becoming my body. You are the church. You are the people who are going to go forth and do this. I empower you, and now it's time for you to step up and do it. And it becomes clear in looking at the ascension that it is a lifelong journey. This is not a journey that ever ends. This is a journey that we follow each and every day of our lives until we, like the disciples before us, go to be with Christ in the kingdom that is to come. Thanks be to God. Amen. There is a prayer by Paul that is connected to this uh, holy day, the Ascension. And I want to use that to, to guide our prayer today. This uh, comes from Ephesians 1. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of our glory, may give each of us a spirit of wisdom and revelation as we come to know God, so that with the hearts of our eyes enlightened, we might know the hope to which we have been called, the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of God's power for us who believe, according to the working of God's great power. And so this day, Lord, we pray that we might hold on to the hope that you have called us to, the hope that you turn and hand over to the disciples, the hope that 
as you have gone to be with the Father, that you empower us to be working on behalf of your kingdom here in this time, in this place. We pray that we might know the riches of your glorious inheritance amongst us, the fruit of the Spirit, the peace, the joy, the goodness, the faithfulness, the self-control, the patience, and most of all, the love that makes what we do powerful, makes it real, makes it incarnate here amongst us. And in the end, we pray for the power to hold on to what you make possible, knowing that in the end, your kingdom is going to come. We pray that our lives might be signs of that kingdom and that your kingdom might be come for uh, those who are serving, for those who are sick, for those for whom this time is uh, marked by loneliness and fear. We pray for your kingdom to come in this nation amongst all those who are making decisions that your will might be done uh, as they seek to serve those who are entrusted to their care. We pray for all these things as we pray in the name, in your name, name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. These videos will continue, as will the letters that go out, and as will uh, worship outside in, 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 the, in, in front of the church at Honeywell and in the parking lot at Shelbina, weather permitting. We will continue to do that uh, until the guidelines uh, shift and we can we'll look at what happens next. Grace be with you. Amen.